introduce um, Chris. Chris did his bachelor's at Michigan in chemical engineering, and from there he moved to Caltech to do his PhD. And initially I was confused because I saw three names as his PhD advisors, I thought perhaps he just had bad luck and moved from lab to lab to lab. But he tells me now he took three you know, professors to mentor him simultaneously at Caltech, and he became a biochemist, biophysicist there. From there he moved to Berkeley uh, to work with Adam Arkin, uh, after which he started his own position in 2003, so roughly 10 years ago. Um, he moved to MIT about two and a half years ago, but while he was at UCSF, he did some really beautiful studies that actually define what we think of synthetic biology today. He's one of the pioneers, the leaders of the field, and for that he won a bunch of awards, the Sloan Fellowship, the Pew Fellowship, the Packard Fellowship, the NSF Career Award, and it goes on. I'm just highlighting a few before I bore you to death. And the indications were there early on. He had one of the most prestigious postdoctoral fellowships and the NSF pre-doctoral fellowships. And to top it all off, he won the MIT's famed TR, the Tech Review Awards in 2006 to be one of the few innovative leaders, of TR35, I believe is what it's called. Um, he's developed a variety of uh, tools that are now being used widely across um, the field and is now also the chief editor of a newly launched journal, the American Chemical Society Synthetic Biology. Um, and some of the you know, beautiful work that's being done is now appearing in that journal. So it's already setting, um, he's bringing his vision to fruition and engaging a larger community. It's a pleasure to have you here, Chris. Uh, with that, we have. Well, thank you, Asim. It's always great to be here. I, I re always really enjoy visiting Wisconsin. It's um, you know, a fantastic nexus of, of chemical engineering and, and the engineering sciences with, with microbiology and, of course, biochemistry and so on. So it's, it's always nice to see uh, what's going on. So I'm coming from the background of engineering. My background is chemical engineering. And I, I say that because this is a biochemistry department. And so I want to make the point that our primary interest is being able to build systems that don't yet exist and to push the scale and the sophistication by which we can do genetic engineering. And so I'm going to start out in this talk just by giving you a little bit of an overview of the types of problems that we hope to be able to address in the near future. And then I'm going to walk through more carefully a story uh, where we've been working to simplify some of the genetics around nitrogen fixation, uh, which is a function that has been tried to be transferred between organisms for some time, and try to leave you with a sense that there's a, a phase change that's happening now in the size and the uh, scale of uh, designs that we can do in, in genetic engineering. So for a long time, uh, we and, and others in the field have uh, dreamt of being able to program cells to do complex functions. And so these are, are some examples of either what has been envisioned of what could be done or uh, things that happen naturally in biology. And so, for example, uh, in the example on the left, uh, this was a student of mine, a postdoc of mine, who then went and joined uh, UC Berkeley, Chris Anderson where his whole dream has been able to engineer bacteria as therapeutic devices, where they go through different microenvironments in the body, they sense where they are, they perform a therapeutic response in each one of those uh, niches, and all of this would be programmed in the DNA. On the right, I'm showing a number of different materials uh, that are naturally produced. So cells are the natural architects of the nano world, I'm showing a glass sponge, which is essentially spinning fiber optic uh, cables, as well as uh, diatoms that live in the ocean and build these very intricate silica structures. So everything on this slide involves being able to program a cell to go through a complex series of tasks, and it's a huge difference from what is currently being done in biotechnology. So if you look at the forefront of companies like DuPont or Dow Ag or even startups like uh, refactored materials or Amaris, they're really about the production of individual small molecules and really just having biology produce that. But that's not getting close to what biology has the capability of doing. 
And so everything that we're trying to do is to bring that scale up where we could actually be able to do these types of functions in cells. And very broadly, there are two things that are required in order to do this. Uh, the first is that you have to be able to manipulate many genes, possibly hundreds of genes. Uh, and you need to be able to control precisely uh, when they're turned on and under what conditions, so the dynamics and the conditions. And so for that, you need synthetic regulation. And so the way that we envision this all coming together and moving towards uh, being able to do this is on the scale of whole genome design, where you could actually go into an organism and be able to construct systems that are on the same scale as the natural genome. And we very roughly uh, divide this up into different categories, where on the far right, we have the actuators, or these are the things that the cell is actually doing. Uh, these are connected to circuitry that's telling when the different systems to turn on, which are then subsequently connected to sensors, which are looking at the individual environment and dictating when things should be uh, activated. So for example, in this uh, fantastical idea of creating a, a cell that can spin its own antimicrobial cloth, you might have a set of genes that are, that are encoding silk proteins, you have another whole set of genes that are making antibiotic nanoparticles. The silk has to be exported at a certain time and then modified. And all of this has to be integrated into a large system. And so uh, my lab is focused on each one of these steps. So being able to sense environments, to be able to process that information with circuitry, and then to control different outputs. Uh, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the last of those steps. So being able to convert any cellular function into an actuator that can be turned on and off whenever we want, and to be able to transfer those cell cellular functions between organisms as easily as possible. So now we've been doing this, and others have been doing it for some time. And this has really been facilitated by the advances uh, in, in DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis. So over the last uh, decade, to uh, two or three decades now of uh, sequencing, uh, there have been sequenced databases that are populated with uh, genomic information that's encoding uh, functions. And all of that information is stored and inaccessible unless you're able to go in and resynthesize the DNA that's encoding those functions. And this was facilitated about a decade ago with the rise of uh, DNA synthesis companies that allow you to go in and print out a lot of pieces of DNA or a lot of genes and screen those for a particular function. And so this has led to an area done by a number of different labs called part mining. And this is where you have an enzyme that you think has an interesting function, but instead of working with that one enzyme, you go in the databases and you print every single enzyme that has that potential function and screen it for activity. And so this is uh, one example of that where we were looking for an enzyme that produced a a methyl halide for sort of random reasons. But instead of working with one uh, gene from one organism, we printed 90 enzymes from 90 different organisms that had any chance of performing this function. And then we identified the top ones, which came from plants and from uh, bacteria that hadn't uh, even been isolated, just part of metagenomic samples and so on. So this is a very simple single gene experiment where you're transferring this function from a plant or from a microbe into a new host in order to take on this new function. And the reason that this was possible, of course, is all of the tools that already exist in genetic engineering. So we had to use synthesis to access the gene, but then we just pop it into an expression plasmid that has an inducible promoter and a ribosome binding site so we can turn the gene on in the new host and so on. So it's a very simple type of operation that allows us to access that function and then turn it on in a new host. So then we started to get interested in functions that can't just be encoded by a single gene, but require many genes collectively activate, uh, turned on in order to, to produce that function. And so this is where we started to get interested in uh, gene clusters. And so what happens in bacteria is that many cellular functions have all of their associated genes encoded in a contiguous region of the genome known as a gene cluster. And so, for example, one of the, uh, the system I'm going to talk the most about today is, uh, uh, encodes nitrogenase activity, 
And this is a 25,000 base pair region of the Klebsiella genome that has all of the necessary genes for this function as well as their regulation. And there are gene clusters that encode just about anything that you can imagine a bacterium doing. So for example, uh, we also work with a, a protein secretion device out of salmonella, which is 35,000 base pairs of DNA. And again, that has all of the necessary genes to build this secretion device and export proteins from the cell. There are many, many examples that produce uh, pharmaceutical-like compounds, uh, things involved in the breakdown of, of biomass and energetic harvesting, uh, including things like light and so on. And so in this, this vision of the future, what we would like to be able to do is to look out at the microbial world and take any willy-nilly functions from different bacteria that we want and plug them together into this single organism that then has some combination of, of abilities. So for example, if I want to be able to export protein, I want to be able to pop in that unit of DNA that uh, encodes the protein secretion device. If I wanted to fix nitrogen, I want to pop in that piece of DNA to fix nitrogen, and so on. So now the challenge with it is that instead of an individual gene that we could just put in front of an inducible promoter, you now have 16 or 20 or 40 genes that all have to be turned on at just the right levels in order to get activity. And so this is just a subset, but with all of the really high throughput sequencing that's been going on, there are literally tens of thousands of gene clusters that encode just about anything that you can imagine. And this is being uh, found in a very automated way. The bioinformatics exists in order to go in and, and identify these different types of functions, and it's growing and scaling with the size of the database. And so when we look in, we often just see all these different functions that we want to be able to move from one organism to the next. And so there are really three things that you need in order to, to do this transfer. Uh, the first is that you need sequencing and bioinformatics, and that's so that you have the information associated with that function, and you have some way of going into the databases and being able to figure out what is the subset of DNA that is required for that activity. But that sequence information is not enough to, to obtain that function. You also need DNA synthesis, and this is because you need some way of being able to reaccess the information and turn it back into physical DNA. But you can't literally resynthesize the DNA sequence from the organism from which you obtain this, because all of the regulation is going to be different between that and the new host. So the third thing that you need is uh, synthetic biology, and this is what allows you to then replace the regulation of that gene cluster so that you can get it to function uh, in, in, the, in the target organism. So we started thinking about these different things and moving from individual genes to sets of genes and, and trying to be systematic about it. And so one of the first problems that we decided to, to start trying to address is, um, is nitrogen fixation. And this is a problem that's uh, been articulated for uh, 30 years or more where the problem is that uh, when we look at organisms, when we look at, at plants and their ability to obtain nitrogen from the environment, uh, most of the uh, uh, plants that we consume are not able to obtain their own nitrogen. So things like legumes and beans uh, are able to form associations with um, microorganisms that deliver uh, nitrogen, but cereals like rice and corn and wheat are not able to do this. And so the way that we've solved this problem in agriculture is through the chemical production of ammonia uh, through Haber-Bosch and usually through the burning of, of natural gas. And so in this way, the cereals are consuming the nitrogen out of the soil, which is then being put back in there through chemical routes. Uh, and this is what has led to the uh, incredible increases in, in cereal yields over the last uh, decades. And so since the 1970s, it's been viewed as, that, as an alternative to this chemical route of, of synthesizing ammonia and dumping it onto the soil, that what you'd really like to do is to take one of the uh, plants that is able to associate uh, with these organisms uh, in the soil and transfer that capability from a legume to a, to a cereal crop uh, through uh, genetic engineering. And this was articulated at the same time that uh, 
the uh, recombinant production of insulin uh, was articulated in the 70s at the Asilomar conference. That quickly was solved and it became uh, Genentech. And I think the reason that was solved quickly is because at the end of the day, it's a transfer of a single gene into a new organism. Whereas, as you'll see, for nitro nitrogen fixation, you require many genes for activity that have to be balanced just right. And the tools haven't been there in order to actually achieve that. And so we decided to start going in and try to figure out what's stopped uh, this ability to transfer this function between organisms and then how the tools of synthetic biology might be able to help with that step. So this is the gene cluster that is the model system for nitrogenase activity. It's from the uh, bacterium Klebsiella. It's a, it's a 20 gene system that's encoded in 25,000 base pairs of DNA. And it has the core genes for the nitrogenase itself, which is what performs the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. It then has a series of genes that create the FEMOCO cofactor and then loads it into the nitrogenase enzyme. It has additional enzymes that are involved in the delivery of electrons to the reaction center. And then it's got a regulatory network that uh, very carefully controls uh, expression. And so one of the first things that we did is we went into this system and we wanted to look at how sensitive it is to changes in the expression levels of the individual component uh, proteins. And so we performed a, a series of experiments like the, the ones I'm showing here, where we would go into the native gene cluster and knock out either an individual gene or a small set of genes, which we then would complement back onto a plasmid so that we could sweep those genes through expression levels and look at the impact on the activity of the system. And what we found is that this is a very fragile system where if you look at it funny, you very quickly lose activity. And so you can see that uh, here, uh, where you have to balance the expression level of the genes just right. And if you're too low or too high, you very quickly lose activity. And each of the, of the subsets of individual genes and combinations of genes have this property. And it's not that they all have to be high or low. Each set of genes has its own optimum level that has to be just right in order to get the activity of the system as a whole. So now what I'm showing with these six graphs is just one slice through this space where we're changing the expression level of a, of a single gene. As soon as you start to do combinations of genes, it gets much more complicated. So for example, if you're looking at the expression level of two genes in this system, each of which has an optimum, then you create this sombrero hat-like space, whereas you change each of those genes from the optimum levels, you very quickly lose, lose activity. So now in a system where you have 16 genes, all of which are very fragile and have to be carefully optimized, you then don't have a two-dimensional space, you have a 16-dimensional space which is this hard to imagine volume, where in somewhere in this space, you've got a, a volume that represents all of the combinations of expression levels that are consistent with activity. And if you're outside that combination of expression levels, you then have an inactive, inactive system. So I know it's hard to think about 16 dimensional spaces. And when I was a student at uh, the University of Michigan, my advisor was Richard Goldstein, and he used to tell these really bad math jokes. And one of his math jokes is, why should you never buy a hyperdimensional watermelon? And as it turns out, as you increase the dimensionality of a space, the surface area over the volume goes to infinity. And so as you increase the dimensionality, most of the, surf most of the volume is on the surface. And so the reason you don't buy a hyperdimensional watermelon is that it's all rind. And uh, I know it's bad. I warned you. The, uh, uh, so what that means is that when you're in this space, you're always on the, on the edifice of falling off and losing function. And so in a transfer experiment where you're taking a uh, gene cluster with 16 genes and you're cutting out and you're popping it into a new organism, you're, even if everything works just right um, and you know all the ribosome binding sites and all the promoters and all the terminators and all the codon usage and everything is just perfect, it, it's not going to get the expression level just right. And so if you wiggle all those expression levels, you end up moving into a new space and losing activity very quickly. Okay? And so then you have to 
try to regain activity, but because the, uh, the system is so redundant and so overlapping and, and so non-modular, it's impossible to make these substitutions, and so you're never able to regain activity. And so we've articulated the problem like that. And then there are certain roles that synthetic biology can help with this process. So on one thing, uh, the way that we think about genetics is very different. And so I'll show you how we can go in and simplify the genetics of a system to make it more conducive and more understandable for transfer. Uh, we also have tools to allow us to very precisely control expression levels so that after the transfer, you can then go back in and tune the expression levels to be just right to get activity. Uh, some of the part design that we've done for E. coli and other organisms can be applied uh, to new hosts. And then I, by the end, you'll see how our ability to construct very large and sophisticated pieces of DNA actually helps us with this process tremendously. So first, I just want to go over some of the, some of the aspects of a gene cluster that actually stop you from being able to transfer it. And so this is uh, what I call the nice nature reviews microbiology view of, of genetics. And so when you look up a particular gene cluster, it's all very nicely organized. But the actual genetics underlying that can get very, com uh, very complex. And it's that complexity that becomes a problem. So for example, there's some internal regulation, but then the system is going to be embedded in the native uh, regulation of its, of its wild type host. And this is often in ways that are, that are poorly characterized. The system also has very non-modular and overlapping part functions. So for example, you know, uh, over half the genes in the nitrogenase gene cluster are overlapping so that the ribosome binding site for the downstream gene is in the middle of the upstream gene. And that's just a common way that you have systems that are encoded. But now if you want to try to change that ribosome binding site, there's no way that you could do it without interfering with the coding sequence of the upstream gene. So that's a very mod non-modular system that's interfering with being able to make substitutions in order to achieve an engineering goal. And there are all types of examples of a genes encoded within genes, even operons are a problem, and so on. Uh, there's also a, a very complex uh, encoding where you have a lot of overlapping functions. And you often see this within open reading frames. And so this is an example of a review paper that was looking at all the different ways that you have promoters in, in a in a gene cluster. And so you've got a lot of examples of promoters within genes pointing upstream. You have promoters going against the, the tide of genes for no reason, promoters pointing at no target, and so on. And so you have all of these overlapping functions. And this stops you from making certain types of moves as you're trying to build a genetic system. So for example, if you took this, this gene here with promoters going the wrong way, and for whatever reason, if you wanted to move it to the front of the cluster, and you found that that was a non-functional system, it may not be the move itself that's the problem, but the promoters pointing the wrong way that then turn on something that you didn't expect that then causes the problem. And then these are just all the things that you know. <clears throat> of course, there are all the unknowns of biology. And even the most well-characterized systems are constantly you're peeling the onion trying to understand more about uh, how the genetics are encoded. So as one example, we were trying to move a promoter from one organism to the next, and it killed our, our target. And uh, we couldn't figure out why, and we gave up. And then years later, there was a paper that showed that there was a small RNA encoded there that interacted with porins, so that when you tried to move that piece of DNA, it then killed the cell because it, it interfered with the porins. And so you've got a lot of examples like that that interfere with your, your ability to to move things around. And so we had to come up with a way that very systematically uh, fixed the natural system to get rid of all of these issues simultaneously. And so to do this, we turned to some of the, the fundamental tenets of synthetic biology. So at the core level in the field, we think of uh, genetic parts. And so these are units of DNA that have some biochemical function, like a promoter, or a ribosome binding site, or an open reading frame, and so on. And we tend to associate a single genetic part with a single function. And that's already quite different than the natural genetic systems, where you have these overlapping parts where you might have multiple functions within one, one part. 
So then based on those parts, you assemble them in order to create a genetic device. And so this has some human identifiable function. It might be a pathway or a circuit or a sensor or whatever that then gets assembled into a system that's a unit of DNA that you then put into a cell that performs that function. And so we've got this hierarchy from parts to devices to the system as a whole that then goes into an organism. Now we wanted to apply this to the problem of gene clusters by flipping it on its head. And so uh, we, we created this process called uh, refactoring which tries to go in and systematically reduce the system into its component parts. And the, the term is stolen from the software industry where if you have a piece of software that's crashing like Microsoft Word or Windows, one thing that you would do as a software engineer is go in and refactor the code. And that means you just start from scratch, you completely rewrote the code to create the same program, but where you've organized the code to be modular and engineerable and stable and so on. So the way that we're applying it here is where we're going in and completely rewriting the DNA sequence of the gene cluster so that it's modular and engineerable and so on, but that it encodes the same function as the wild type system. And so what we do, and we mostly do this on the computer, is we go in and we have a, uh, have a gene cluster and uh, we start out by getting rid of all of the non-coding DNA so anything that's not an open reading frame gets thrown out. We then take the open reading frames and we go through a process that we call codon randomization. And this is where we try to select codons that encode the same amino acid sequence, but produce a DNA sequence that's as far away as possible from the wild type sequence. And the idea there is that we create open reading frames that have so many mutations in them that they eliminate all the internal promoters and small RNAs and, and operator sites and so on and so forth uh, just by random chance. And so we have genes that are inert for everything other than uh, encoding the amino acid sequence they're supposed to encode. And at the same time that we're doing the codon randomization, we're also running all of these algorithms that we have to find these functions and we eliminate them when we do find them. We then organize the genes into artificial operons. So these are organizations that make sense to us, but not, not necessarily the native organization. We then uh, add synthetic genetic parts that we've characterized in isolation. For example, ribosome binding sites and terminators and so on. We then use uh, phage uh, polymerase promoters to control the level of transcription. And then the last step is that we create what we call a controller. And so this is the, usually a genetically uh, distinct uh, a construct that we build that has the synthetic sensors and circuitry uh, to control the timing and the conditions for expression. And then this, the output of the circuits then produce the RNA polymerases, which then go on and turn on the pathway. So at the end of this process, we're left with a gene cluster that has absolutely no DNA identity with the wild type. It's been designed to be modular and, and organized. We've gotten rid of all of the native regulation and replaced it with this controller that when we pop in the cell, it then is, uh, encodes when and uh, the dynamics of expression. And the remarkable thing about this process is it, is it works. And we, we published the first version of it last year. So this is the example of uh, the refactored nitrogenase gene cluster. And uh, it's a little hard to look at at first, but as engineers, this picture makes a lot more sense to us than the Nature Review's microbiology paper. And the reason for that is if you look, first of all, it's, it's highly modular. So each box is a unit of DNA that's a part that has a prescribed function where we know what that function is doing because we put it there. Uh, and we've independently measured it. So for example, if we look at, uh, it's very hard to see, uh, but if we look at each of the ribosome binding sites in a system, you'll see a number underneath them. And that's the strength or the expression level that that ribosome binding site's achieving. And you see the same thing with promoters. We know the strength of that promoter. Terminators even, we know the strength of that terminator. And so each one of these, these parts has been put in the, in the system for a purpose. And then we can uh, control the the expression of the entire 16 gene system with a separate controller, uh, which encodes this logic function. Uh, 
And so here we just have two small molecules that are, that are inputs. And we can turn on the entire 16 gene system uh, when those inputs are in the right conditions of that logic and then it stays off otherwise. And so we've gone in, we've made this modular system. We can drop in a controller, control when, the conditions that it turns on and so on. Uh, and so we've had this improved activity. Or this improved, um, we reduce the function. It actually comes at a cost of activity. So the process of simplification initially created a system that was much less functional than the wild type system. And you can see that here, where in the, in the wild type we have a high level of nitrogenase activity and then in the first version of the refactor system we only recover about 7% of uh, activity. And so this, this process of simplification came at this cost. And so we started to look back and uh, the, the process of going through this actually took about seven years to create the first uh, refactored system. And so we started to look at, well, why, do, why was it so slow? What were the things that allowed us to speed up during that time so that we might get faster in, in moving forward? And so I just have summarized those seven years in this one step, which is the first uh, uh, subsystem that we tried to work with in this pathway, where we started out by trying to refactor one of the, one of the operons in the system that only encoded five genes. This was back in 2004. And what would happen is that on the computer, we'd create a refactored version, send it off for DNA synthesis. It would cost $10,000 to synthesize this thing. This was a while ago. And we just completely lose activity, so you get no activity. Uh, and then, just to give you a sense of the scale of, the, of uh, how quickly we were able to fix things, uh, we would then have to go in and we could build about five at a time where we would cross the wild type and the synthetic, trying to figure out exactly what part of the refactor system was causing the problem. We would then figure out, oh, okay, so the, the first NIF-H gene that we tried to uh, code on randomized created, in this case, transposon insertion sites, which then destroyed the activity of that gene. So we'd have to go back, resynthesize the gene, find that it worked, but not at an optimal level, then manually try to uh, tune the ribosome binding site until you recovered activity. So in this sort of design build test cycle, we were doing about five at a time with a very small region of, of the cluster and trying to identify um, improvements. And then we would have to build the entire cluster and the tools during this period were just not there for this. Where we would have to assemble about a hundred or so uh, genetic parts each time. So we would do it in a hierarchical assembly. So what I'm showing here are all the different portions of the cluster along with the percent of activity. And so with this method Gibson's assembly came online at the tail end which actually is what allowed us to build these at all. So we could assemble them into these larger pieces of DNA, but we'd lose activity very fast. And so this half cluster is at 10% of activity, which is the multiple of this subclusters. And then here we'd get 3%, which again is the multiple. And actually the first system that we assembled took like uh, four months and we only got 0.3% activity. We were actually really excited by it, but you had to hold the paper just right in order to uh, see any activity. So we would go back, you'd have to go all the way back to the beginning, uh, re-optimize those that were the, the pinch points, re-go through this process of assembly, which would take a long time, and we got one that was functional, and that's what we published uh, as the first step. But we said after seven years, we've got to do something differently, right? We have to approach this problem in a fundamentally different way. And so we started thinking about, well, what's actually the ways that we're going to do this faster? And there are two general ways that you can think about optimizing this process. The first, if you have a design build test cycle where you're designing a construct, you build the physical DNA and then test it and then learn from it, you could imagine going faster by going through each of these steps faster. So you go through more design build test cycles per unit time. We decided to do a, a slightly different approach. Uh, and this is where we partnered with the Broad Institute to take a massively parallel approach. Uh, where instead of designing a single construct, we would design hundreds of constructs simultaneously, build each one of the, those constructs, test each one for activity, and then apply learning algorithms to go back to the design. <coughs> and so then you could, in this very massive way, try out a lot of designs simultaneously. And so this is a collaboration with the Broad Institute, which is 
which was abs absolutely critical in this, uh, because what they did is, is they applied manufacturing principles to the process of DNA sequencing. And this is what led to all the advances in, in uh, it was, was a major contributor to uh, the advances that led to the human genome effort and all the metagenomics that's going on, so on. And uh, this is their facility. It was designed by Toyota. Uh, and it's really a manufacturing pipeline. It's not an academic lab. It's in an old warehouse. They used to store the beer and the popcorn for their Red Sox. Uh, and so it, they're now able to sequence about 4.3 trillion base pairs per day. Uh, which is absolutely incredible. So we decided to get involved with them and retool these processes so that we could do DNA synthesis and assembly uh, at a much higher scale than what we can do now. And this is where we, uh, uh, we, we built this thing that we call the uh, MIT Broad Foundry. And we went in and, and have been working on each one of the steps. One is rethinking genetic design so that instead of building single constructs, we can build many and one, uh, design many in one. Uh, one in an equal amount of time. Uh, then build all of those constructs to specification, very rapidly test out a lot of, of um, constructs, as well as uh, genome scale transcriptomics and proteomics and so on, and then learn from that enormous data set that you get. And so we set this up as a pipeline. They, their manufacturing people went in and have, have started uh, working out all of the limbs and how you, how you get the computer-aided design to communicate with the construction and quality checking and so on. So I'm going to go through some of the academic uh, questions that we had to address. Uh, so one of the first ones is that we realized that really for the last 30 years, we've been designing genetic constructs in exactly the same way. And these are tools like Vector NTI, and I'm sure everybody in the room has used one at some point, where we think of a genetic design as a plasmid. And so if you have a small plasmid with three genes and a dozen parts, this is a visualization that makes sense. But as soon as you build a, uh, try to design a very large system, like this is one of our, uh, nitri this is the refactored uh, nitrogenase cluster uh, in vector NTI, it just becomes a total mess. First of all, just going in and trying to make sure which gene goes where is a, is a huge problem. Um, you make mistakes. Um, there's, there's really no way that you would do this 10,000 times, right? It would, it would take up a huge effort or you just have to resort to some random method. So what we did is we partnered with uh, Doug Densmore at, at Boston University. And Doug had caught my attention because he developed a uh, different way of articulating a genetic design that was fundamentally different than uh, how we had been thinking of it. And it's uh, part of what he calls the Eugene language. So instead of that vector, there's a code here. And don't worry about uh, what it looks like. Uh, and what you do is instead of having a single construct that you're trying to build, you identify the parts that are in your system. So underneath this file, you would get all of the DNA sequences for the parts in the system. And then instead of saying this particular construct is this combination of parts, you create rules in your system. And the rules are anything uh, that you can, as an experimentalist, write down about how you would describe the genetics of your system. So this promoter has this particular RBS. All the genes have to point the same way. These three genes have to be in operon. That one has to be in, a, in its own cistron, so on and so forth. Anything that you, you can articulate can be captured in this language, written very simply in Eugene, which then gets converted into a machine-readable code. And this is critical, because as soon as the machine can read it, the machine can design it. And so you can convert this into a, into a genetic construct uh, that captures all of the parts and all of the rules between those parts. So if you're not use, used to thinking about this, by the way, this is going in vector NTI. And so this, is, this isn't just sort of the fantasy of, of our lab, but this, is, I think, is a, really a direction where genetic design is going. If you're not used to thinking about parts and rules between parts, uh, we can turn to Shakespeare and uh, think about how we could assemble words into sentences rather than uh, genetic parts into constructs. And so one, <clears throat> the simplest way you could do it is where you just have a list of English words and you randomly combine them so to create sentences like iron clothes put adhering behind study. But then you can apply grammatical rules on top of that and start to generate random sentences, but ones that adhere to the grammatical rules, like the wife anchors the monkey. Uh, 
And then you can start to apply constraints on top of that system, like two always before B. You can start generating new sentences and learning from those sentences and, and so on to create new constraints which further condense your system. And so the way that this works for the genetic designs is that we can start out by defining all of the parts in a system. And then once we do that, we can write a little program that then permutes those parts to come together randomly. And as you would expect, you then end up with nonsensical designs. So you have genes without any transcription or translation control, multiple RBSs in series, promoters pointing against genes, and so on. So you just get random nonsense. But then you can articulate things like expression rules. So every gene needs an RBS. Every RBS gene pair requires a promoter and a terminator and so on and so forth. You can articulate those as rules and then rerun the process and it condenses that space. So now you only uh, create constructs that are at least consistent with transcription translation rules. Uh, as these, every gene has an RBS, there's always a promoter somewhere upstream and a term terminator downstream. And then you can add whatever rules you want to apply to your system. So for example, uh, have it where three genes are in one operon, and then one gene is by itself in its own cistron. And even there in this simple four gene system, there's still a huge amount of diversity that's possible with that system. And this is one of the real surprises that, come, that, that came out of this, where it's really hard to constrain your system to just one construct because all of, all of the ways that you can float the system. And you can even think of this in terms of if you're building a single plasmid where you're just trying to express a protein, you know, there are all these design choices you make that you don't mean. Like you could uh, use this multiple cloning site versus this one, or flip the whole cassette this way or that way. And if you enumerate all those different ways, you actually have a lot of uh, diversity that's, that's possible. And, and you're making design considerations that aren't really there. So anyway, so the output of this program are these different um, constructs, but then this feeds, doesn't just make pretty pictures, it feeds into the pipeline uh, for the robotics and the uh, assembly process to actually build each one of those constructs. And so we use a, a series of hierarchical assembly methods that start out with small parts that assemble them into essentially individual genes and then, and then final constructs. And so we started out just by doing very simple assemblies uh, where we were very constrained by the, the, uh, the system, where we would just do things like switch promoters and RBSs and so on, because we had this feeling that the architecture had to be relatively fixed compared to wild type. And we would assemble the, the, uh, the genes for this, so this is one example. And you can go in and screen this and then learn uh, new, new rules from it. This is an example of a, another early library that we built where we added a little bit more diversity, but still keeping the overall architecture more or less the same. And uh, again, reassembling. And then you can see in this case, now remember this is not random uh, library. Each one of these has the same amount of design information before you run the experiment. But then after you run the experiment, you learn something that can then be re-articulated as a rule back into the design process. And so in this case, we could figure out a rule, uh, which then allowed us to optimize this uh, subcluster. So we went from less than 20% activity to recovering full activity for that system. So then we went in, and we had started noticing with different projects in the lab that actually the, the less we felt constrained to the wild type genetics, the better off we were in our library. And so we, we decided to build this library for one of the six genes subportions of the nitrogenase cluster that was causing us a lot of trouble. And so we built a, a library that we called the Stata Library because uh, the Stata building is a, is a building on campus by uh, Geary that just looks messed up and our library looks messed up. Uh, so if you look carefully, if it, in this case, um, before we were putting all of these constraints like operon uh, occupancy and stuff like that, and in this case, we just said, if we don't know for 100% that it's not a rule, we'll leave it out. And we'll only put things in the system that we know are rules. And we'll just permute around everything else. We'll let everything else float. And so we created this library that is one operon in a wild type system, but it was up to seven promoters, genes pointing every which direction, uh, op op 
or on occupancy and order, changing, um, just going crazy. There's a bunch of constructs that get designed. Uh, and then there, this has to turn into an assembly map that takes small pieces of DNA and then uh, combines them into transcription units, into build bigger pieces of DNA uh, that, that get physically combined. And this is all done in parallel. And a lot of the software is trying to figure out the optimal way to get the final set of units of DNA with the smallest number of combinations of parts that you have to do. So we then screen this particular library and we found that uh, the top hit was really surprising in that it looks absolutely nothing like the wild type system. The, the wild type system and the first refactored are both single operons with uh, six genes. And our, our best uh, uh, cluster had uh, seven different promoters, genes changing orientations, um, just an enormous amount of diversity. And it's not that that had to be a way to solve the problem. We also found one that looked very much like wild type with just different parts in the location. And so we found these very genetically distinct um, uh, uh, constructs that are coming out of the hits. And we can be very quantitative about it. I won't really go into it, but we can, this is showing a map uh, of each construct where lines indicate similar constructs and just showing that we, if we map out the space, we see high activity shown in green spread out throughout the region. And we can be very quantitative and so on. So when we went in, uh, uh, we then had an improved uh, cluster where everything shown in, in red is, is an improvement. Uh, and you can see this divided up where the HDK portion got up to 100%. The BF, BQF USV WZM is up to 100%. And the last bit of, of EN, ENJ was a bit of an issue. So then we, uh, once we built this, this infrastructure, we could then start building extremely large libraries of, of clusters, again, all by design. And so this is an example of about 120 16 gene clusters where we were very systematic about how we varied the components of the cluster. And this is about 3.5 megabases of synthesis and assembly. So it's as though we built a bacterial genome now in the scale of the experiment that we did. Uh, and we do it at very high efficiency with only 4% uh, error rate, meaning that 96% of that library are perfect, and then 4% have mutations. And that's allowed us to then go in and, and improve this system uh, further. And, and uh, all the components are very high, and then the top cluster altogether is about 60%, um, again, showing in red those parts that had to get substituted for activity. So what we're finding is that one of the, the big questions when we started uh, was whether when we take this very dramatic process where we wipe out all of the native regulation and replace it with synthetic regulation, whether there was something about the wild type that we were missing about the, uh, with the system that we were just eliminating and could never get back. And what we're finding is that we can do just as well or almost just as well with a completely synthetic system. Uh, and I think we're, we're very uh, close to fully uh, recovering the activity. So now we've started some uh, species transfer uh, experiments, and, uh, uh, and uh, this is something we're, we're just now starting. Um, so one of the simple examples is E. coli. This, is, this has been done by other labs with a native system. It's just a, a simple example uh, uh, looking at how systems change and kind of laying out our, our strategy for it. Uh, so we start out with Klebsiella with a system that is non-modular, um, and then we refactor it, we lose activity, we optimize it to boost it up. We can then transfer it into E. coli and we lose it back down again. And so we see this loss again in activity. But then because we have a modular system, we can do something that we couldn't do with the wild type cluster, which is to go in and, and optimize it. And so this is an example where we then built a library to re-optimize activity, uh, where we took a, a numerical optimization approach where we uh, switched between low and high ribosome binding sites and then uh, in systematically learned from that information to drive the next library and so on. And so this is where across all 16 genes, we're swapping the ribosome binding sites systematically. And you wouldn't be able to do that, for example, if your genes have their ribosome binding sites in the middle of an, of an upstream gene and so on. And so with this, we're able to uh, recover activity. So we're starting to take a, a similar approach, looking at more uh, sophisticated organisms that would be the, the targets of the transfer. So now I talked about um, uh, nitrogen fixation. I'll just uh, uh, 
conclude with some of the other systems that we've gone through this process. And I started out with this goal of trying to integrate across the different synthetic systems that we're working with to build up towards uh, whole genome design. And you can start to see how this, how this comes together. So for example, with metabolic pathways, we've gone in and, and refactored individual pathways that in this case just uh, have metabolic products that change the color of the cells. And then in the, in the controller, we have uh, a logic operation uh, with synthetic circuits that switches between two different phage polymerases that turn on the two different pathways under different conditions specified by the sensors. We have a nitrogenase system that, that I showed, and we've done the same thing for uh, type 3 secretion uh, in salmonella using a different polymerase. So now you can imagine taking these two different cellular functions and combining them into a single unit so that you could have different output signals from your uh, circuits that are turning on whether the cell is producing nitrogenase or is secretion competent. You can start to build up that, that uh, function. Uh, so just to conclude, um, I started out by describing some of the genetic challenges that confront you when you try to transfer a genetic system from one organism to the next. And so we created this process whereby we go in and are systematic in stripping out all of the native regulation. And by doing that, we create a system that's highly modular, but we lose the activity. And so we have to go through this process of reoptimization in order to recover the, the wild type activity back which then allows us to go in and be systematic about transferring it to a new host and trying out different, different combinations of parts uh, in that host to re-optimize uh, the activity. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, conclude and take any questions. Bacala. My thinking is very similar to yours. Perhaps because we both have background and chemical engineer, and that was the approach. And I think what you presented was very clear and very nice result. I would only say that it's important also to start with elements. For instance, there are better promoters than probably you used, better regulating promoters because not existing in nature because I think the best way to regulate promoter is turn it back and forth by inverting, which would be very non efficient instead of using other. So I'm looking forward for next edition of further. Yeah, and I didn't have a chance to talk about it, but actually our promoters as well as our, our ribosome binding sites are are completely synthetic and actually were designed themselves by computer algorithms. So we know the, uh, and, and because we're using phage polymerases, it's an ultra simplified, very small promoter. And um, if for us, we need this, like you describe, if you flip a piece of DNA, so if you flipped a promoter into a spot, that would then be a very hard on and off. In our case, what we like to do is have a system that's completely off until we add the controller that has a phage polymerase. And so the phage promoters themselves, both were engineered by computers, and they themselves have really no activity until you put in the controller that then has the phage polymerases that then allow that system to be turned on and, and controlled. And so the, the point I'm making is that everything except the amino acid sequence itself of the final system we have was, was completely by design. So even a ribosome binding site, not only do we know the strength, but we know the strength because we have a biophysical model that calculates the free energy of ribosome binding to the RNA or uh, RNA polymerase binding to the promoter and so on. So we can really decouple for that part exactly where it gets its function and its contribution to the Anyway, it uh, was Shakespeare to me. It was beautiful. Oh, thanks. But I have to run. Yes, absolutely. It's dark. Yeah, 
So one thing that's interesting is that for this and a lot of the projects in the lab, we're actually driving more and more away from how the natural genetics are encoded. Um, and actually, the next generation of refactor systems that we have uh, look just nothing like biological organizations. So one thing is we've gotten rid of operons altogether so that every gene is under monocystronic control, its own promoter, its own terminator. Then on top of that, we've, we have insulators that are very good at transcriptionally isolating each one of those units and separating the function of the promoter and the ribosome binding site so you can independently control them, whereas right now you can't. Um, and so you've got these highly, highly modular subunits going through the system that really just look absolutely nothing like the, the native system, which what emerges from evolution is this kind of bubble gum and sticks, just whatever worked next, kind of putting it all together. And so you get these redundant functions and overlapping and so on and so forth. And a big part of being able to engineer those systems is to strip all of that, all of that away. Um, in terms of like the interface with how we think about it in directed evolution, I actually came out of a directed evolution lab where you apply random mutagenesis to an enzyme and then identify function or a metabolic path or whatever. So we, we definitely do that type of thing. The difference here is that if you, uh, you can't do it to multi-gene systems effectively. So you could take a system and randomly mutagenize it and kind of select for improved activity, but you couldn't take one of these clusters, move it into a host and randomly mutagenize it and hope to just find an individual mutant uh, that's gonna, gonna work. And so our, the way our system works is that we put all of the information we have into the, to the program, it creates the constructs. Each one has the same amount of design information. It's a little bit, but that doesn't mean each one's gonna have the same function. So we can then screen, and then based on that screening information, try to extract new rules for how the system is composed, and then put that into the next round of, of design. One thing I didn't show, for example, is that if you're systematic about breaking up the gene cluster, uh, we find that none of the genes have to be in an operon together except NIFI and NIFN. And gee, if you really break that pair up, you run into trouble. So the next round we build, we say, well, we'll make everything monocystronic because that's easy to control, but gee, we better keep these two genes together so that we, we're more careful about their regulation. And so you learn systematically these types of rules that go back in and then help you with the next round of design. Yeah? So um, two questions. I guess one would predict that um, since all these were engineered to work in a particular nutritional condition or environmental condition, that if you change that condition at all, uh, do you have to start from square one? Or can you just tweak it mildly and, and uh, optimize the, for the new environment? And the second question is, um, go ahead and answer that one. OK, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So there's, there's two answers to that. Um, one that's highly sensitive that we don't know how to deal with yet and one that's less so. So the, the particular one showing this type of project where we have a, a large multi-gene system and really the parts that we're referring to are ribosome binding site strengths. So if what matters is the ratio between proteins, then you'd have to expect that those those ribosome binding sites would go sort of out of rank order in the new ki condition to the extent that it severely affected your, your function. And we're using phage polymerases and so on. So in that sense, there's less of an issue. However, the synthetic regulation, which is something I didn't even go into in this talk, like synthetic sensors and circuitry saying when things should be turned on, are highly sensitive to condition. And so one example of that with the nitrogenase system is that it's very strongly ammonia repressed. And when we eliminate all the native regulation, it's no longer sensitive to ammonia. But when we put it with our synthetic controller, plus or minus ammonia, it causes the expression levels from the controller of the regulators to change, which then changes the overall activity of the, of the pathway. So you can go in and genetically fix that by tuning the expression level higher of the polymerase than you had in the other condition, but really what you want is a system that maintains 
you know, a, a set point control over the amount of polymerase independent of whatever condition it has. So what we find is the sensitivities that you're describing are mostly on the synthetic regulation side and less on the pathway architecture side. Uh, so, uh, it, so that's actually a big current challenge. So uh, one of the libraries I showed very quickly is sort of said something happened here. And that's an example where you could go in by I and we could see what happened and, and re-articulate that as a rule. Sometimes we're able to extract statistically from the data things like the NIF-EN combination that I was saying and then put that back in a rule. The real challenge we've been having, which we're not close to fixing, is um, if you create a, th a three or four megabase library where you diversify 16 genes in all different ways in very complex combinations, by eye and by expertise and even statistical methods, can't figure out what's going on. And so you get crazy rules from machine learning algorithms and so on. And so where our focus has been is actually not just creating the power, the algorithms that allow you to go in and work out that data, but actually design the constructs themselves in such a way that they allow you to extract the information when you're done with the experiment. So and even old ideas like design of experiments applied to genetics and that type of thing actually become very, very powerful. So as another part of our next generation designs are designing it to, to then allow us to test many questions in parallel such that the algorithms are able to pull out certain classes of information from the data set. Yeah? It seems to me highly unlikely that you would ever get full reconstitution of electronics activity by just refactoring uh, the DNA, because you'll never uh, eliminate any allosteric interactions that are going to be embedded in all of those gene products. Have you guys thought about ways to refactor it well, any, uh, <clears throat> any allosteric issues would be exactly the same. So there's no difference between the refactored and the, and the non-refactored system because it's the same proteins. It's the same. Everything's the same from the... Uh, from the Right. So in the native host, we should be able to recover activity. When you transfer it, uh, there are certainly going to be situations where you wouldn't be able to do that for a whole number of reasons. But there are a lot of examples of projects where just getting any activity then allows you to, so you get a small amount of activity of nitrogenase in certain target organisms. That really gives you the foothold to then push that forward. Or if you're scanning for natural products like chemicals that are being produced by native organisms, you only need a small amount for that initial transfer. And then you can run the directed evolution or whatever it is that you're going to do to then optimize that system back up. But so for us, it's really about getting, increasing the probability that you get some function immediately after transfer. <clears throat> Yeah, so what we found, so we only build the genes once um, because we found as long as you get like a reasonably expressing gene that it's, you can control the expression levels pretty much wherever you need with the synthetic parts. I actually don't, when we were talking, I was talking about Landic about this earlier, the, the cut on optimization as a means of controlling expression levels is really terrible. So basically it's that there's something about the gene that's screwing you up if you have low expression levels. And once you fix that, then that becomes a, the substrate for, for being able to swing through different levels of activity. And so, um, so for us, that's it. Once we have 16 genes that we know work well, we, can, we don't have to go back and create new, new versions of that as part of the process. Yeah. So Chris, in the example of putting the nitrogenase in the E. coli, yeah. is it yet working well enough that it will provide E. coli with a nitrogen source? Or is that how, how far away do you 
it's enough where you can grow uh, slowly on. So you could do a selection experiment. For example. In fact, we have. Yeah. Yep. Well, if there aren't any more questions, let's join me in thanking Chris for a wonderful seminar. <laughs>